<laughs> well, I am grateful for y'all's attendance today for being with us on this uh, a really nice Tuesday. It's a cool Tuesday. Um, grateful for not just y'all's presence, but I hate that I missed last week. I was actually preaching a gospel meeting in Tennessee last week. Uh, so I bring you all the greetings from the North Bradley Church of Christ and just north of Chattanooga in Cleveland, Tennessee. Uh, enjoyed a wonderful time with them. Uh, they were uh, they're a church plant. They're only three years old. It's the first church plant in that county in Tennessee in a hundred years, mm -hmm. and uh, very excited and doing some great things there. And so um, I'm grateful to been able to travel and visit with them uh, for a couple of days. We will be doing kind of a broad overview of Galatians uh, is where we're at. And before we get started, Clay, would you lead us in an opening prayer? God, we thank you so very much for opportunities to study the Bible and. Father, uh, uh, bless Brandon as he leads us through this uh, time of looking at Galatians, and, and please open our hearts to be accepting and uh, of your will and your word, and uh, just bless our time together. We're always glad to, to be able to be together and study your Bible. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, I'll also make a, a small pitch tonight, if you have the opportunity to come back. Uh, tonight is our monthly kind of I would kind of it's like a pseudo book club type thing that we're doing on Tuesday nights and it's usually what is it the second Tuesday of every month yeah. somewhere right around there it's on the church calendar on the website you can go and find it it's called inklings how many of you know what the inklings are something small perfect okay so there so inklings is actually the original book club that was founded by C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien and others at Oxford University and they were a writing club in fact, it's where they started their writing their books specifically. If you've known any of their books, the Chronicles of Narnia and the Lord of the Rings and the rest all came about from these Christian scholars gathering together and um, writing. Uh, so from that, we are doing a study of Western civilization literature. Uh, typically, it's once a month. Um, and tonight, um, I'll be doing a presentation on Macbeth. So Shakespeare's Macbeth. But the main reason I would love to invite you is also because the college program is actually going to be with us on each one of these nights. And so we'll have a dinner at 630. And so I'm throwing this out there because Greg's cooking tonight. So just tell him and he'll make some extra. Um, love to have you come join us. Also get to know some of our college students, spend some time with them. Uh, not so much for my presentation on Macbeth, but nearly as much on creating relationships with a generation that is uh, looks up to you in a lot of ways. Brandon, yes, sir. Does it look like you're recording? Yes, okay. it is. You are screen sharing and recording. Red Little red dot is flashing. Yes. Did yes. Macbeth kill everybody in sight? <laughs> Most of Shakespeare's plays, everybody dies in sight. Yes. <laughs> so it's a very Christian theme. Uh, no, it's. So we'll be taking a look at that, but that is my personal invitation uh, Personal invitation for you all to join us tonight. The actual Macbeth presentation will start at 7, goes to about 7.45, give or take, uh, but our college students will be with us. Love for you all to join us if you have opportunity to do that this evening. Um, so that's my little spiel, my little plug for that. So Galatians, um, has anybody here had opportunity to visit Turkey, modern day Turkey at some point in time in life? I know Greg has... Uh, okay, wonderful. So my my childhood, as I've noticed, I grew up in Italy. My father ran an American universities overseas program. And so I had opportunity quite a bit to travel to different places across Europe, the Middle East and other places uh, to walk in the footsteps of Paul, walk in the footsteps of Peter. And it was a, a true blessing in my life, especially as I look back now, to have been able to visit many of these places. Some of the memories that I have of um, especially, uh, there's a Turkish town called Kusadasi, which is right near uh, Ephesus. And so if you were to get off on the ship as we normally would, we would disembark, we would walk across, the bazaar people would come out trying to grab you in to buy all their stuff. And you would finally make it to the ruins of Ephesus and you'd be able to see and stand inside the beautiful amphitheater where they were as the great uh, chaos of crowds that showed up that started a riot at one point in time. And so if you see these little moments in history and then you go, wow, it was here. These were these places. I would love nothing more if I had the ability to transport all of us this morning to Southern Turkey, to this place, this area of Galatia, which is where Paul was writing to. And that's where I kind of need to start. Paul is the author uh, of this letter. Um, and my job today is to kind of give you a broad overview. There's a reason why we know this. Number one, Paul names himself in the first chapter and says, Paul, 
Uh, he also does it in chapter five, I believe, verse two. He names himself again as the author. Uh, there is very little, almost no doubt that Paul the Apostle wrote this. There are a few people out there historically who have tried to make different claims along the way, but that has not only fallen on deaf ears, it's just nonsense. Um, people who address the letters the way Paul does, the way Paul writes, if you look from letter to letter, you see not just consistencies, but you see even the, the grammatical way he writes, the structure of sentences and the rest is Pauline in its essence. What was the... These people that claim he did. Yes. Who do they claim did? So the, they Paul. typically will add someone else. It may be uh, Barnabas is one of the other ones they throw out. Um, and a lot of this has to do with they try to tie it into the book of Hebrews and who wrote Hebrews and the similarities and things of that nature. But candidly, it's just it's it's not it's real. Yes. You, you have it, the simplest answer is almost always the right one. And in this case, Paul notes himself and the rest. The early church fathers, including Polycarp, Justin Martyr, Arrhenius, and Tertullian, all view this as Paul. They note that consistently. So we're talking about people literally less than 50 years removed from the life of Paul said Paul wrote it. Um, and in that time, that was a, a huge thing. Most New Testament scholars view Galatians as an exemplary representation of Paul's writing style. In Paul's writing and his theology, it matches from book to book. It's very consistent across the way. So Paul, I believe 100% is the author of the book of Galatians, the letter to the area of Galatia, broadly, uh, to those churches. The original audience, and this is letters addressed, and we see this in verse 2 of chapter 1, is the letter is addressed to the churches in Galatia. So this is not a letter that was specifically written to one person, like Timothy. Uh, it was, or Titus, it was written to the churches broadly. So it was sent and meant to be read aloud in the assemblies and then passed to the next church, read aloud to the assemblies, passed to the next church. It was a traveling letter. It would go from place to place to help remind them. And we'll see as we get into some of the text why he is sending this. The reason behind this letter that is being sent to the church of Galatia, because there is conflict arising. Now, that shouldn't surprise you if you've read most of the New Testament, because most of the New Testament is the apostles and others writing letters going, please stop being this way. <laughs> please go back to the what we taught you. Don't leave your first love. Don't get lost in the mire of all this other stuff. Focus on that which was taught to you over and over again. That is what Paul and Peter and John and others write fairly consistently. And so the historical events detailed in the book, including Paul's Jewish heritage, persecution of the church, conversion and travel itinerary that if we look back in history are in harmony with the book of the accounts of Acts and other epistles. So as Galatians is being written, it, you can directly see the connection back to where was Paul when he came through this. In fact, you will see modern day Turkey. Uh, we know that Paul visited the region of Galatia multiple times during his missionary journeys. Um, Acts 16.6 and Acts 18.23 are two connections I would love for you to make and to be able to see that. That's where you'll see Paul in that region. Uh, and Galatia, Galatians is the only epistle to be written to a group of churches rather than an individual church or a specific person. Okay, that's a unique one. Now, I had this come up in my class on Sunday. Uh, Sunday morning, we were, we were reading the book of Luke. We're going through the gospel of Luke. And here's my question. Who is the Gospel of Luke written to? Theophilus. Theophilus. In fact, he starts and says, "In uh, as, as others have begun to write and do these things, I too took it upon myself to give forth this testimony of what I have found most excellent Theophilus. In fact, the book of Acts actually begins the same way, does it not? It says, uh, well, as after my first time, here I'm continuing the story, most excellent Theophilus. And the question arose, why in the world do we not call that first and second Theophilus? <laughs> and I honestly don't have an answer for that. It's too long. It's, it may be first, first Theophilus, second Theophilus, but the reality is, is that they we've ascribed it. They would, because they, they actually do go together. Right. The companion works, but we have the Gospels because uh, Luke sets forth to write the Gospel. So now it's attributed to who it is that's writing it. But we don't have the book of First Paul. So it's always fascinating how, how we arrived at the names of what we call things. In fact, Acts is not always called Acts. Acts is typically referred to as what? Acts of the Apostles. 
uh, or the story, but then you might think, well, it's actually just the second letter to Theophilus. The sec so anyways, just a fascinating little side note about how we arrive at the names, because we forget that these were letters, individual letters written to different individuals, written to churches, written to large groups, written to specific people, or written just as a narrative. Mm -hmm. And those in general, all of these different styles, is where we can also find a lot of extra biblical outside historical relevancy, because they're so different, yet they all tell the first story all almost, I mean, it's perfectly told from start to end. And so there's a beauty in that consistency that's found. So this is the uh, only epistle to be written to the church, a group of churches. Um, and it is um, uh, around the second, uh, what I believe to be um, the southern part of Turkey, uh, what would be modern day Turkey, which is the area of Galatia, that was under Roman rule during Paul's life. And so this was all part of greater Rome, of Rome as the people broadly. Uh, so north central Turkey, southern Turkey, mo uh, modern day. Now, date and location, this is a fun one. Uh, Galatians is a, I would say it's not a controversial book as to when it was written, but there is a lot of back and forth, what's called the, uh, often called the the north uh, argument or the south argument of Paul and the writing of Galatians. The date of the letter and geographical location of this group of churches is debated by a lot of New Testament scholars. Now, it's debated nowadays. None of this has to do with actually the content of the letter, okay? So don't miss that. Nobody's debating whether or not what Paul wrote was true or right. They just go, yes, but who was he writing it to? Um, and so there's a back and forth. The Southern Galatian theory proposes that the letter was sent to the churches in Pisidian, Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derby that Paul established during the first missionary journeys of Acts 13 and 14. That's called the Southern theory. The Northern Galatian theory holds that Paul had a church planning ministry in the North during his second missionary journey, found in Acts 16, 6 and 8 and 1823, and asserts that Galatians was written for those churches. So it's basically it's first missionary journey or second missionary journey. Okay, so that's kind of the concept of who this was written to. I'm not going to leave you hanging and say, like, it doesn't matter. I do believe in that. I believe it's the first. I believe it is the 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 southern um, uh, the southern parts of the southern Galatian theory, because I believe it was written in 49 AD. 4950 AD is my belief that this was written after the first missionary journey that Paul made through that area. That is predominantly what most scholars believe. Um, but I would say it's probably 65-35, um, northern versus southern, as to who it was written to. Uh, but I believe it was earlier on in his writings, and this was one of the earlier writings of the New Testament. Um, but it's that's the controversy uh, to this. And candidly, if that's the controversy, it's not much of a controversy. Is when it was written, whether it was written to the churches in the north or the south. My main problem is, is there's really not a lot of evidence that Paul went to the North Park. There's a lot of evidence he was in the South Park. In fact, he mentions a lot of the churches and people from those areas. He never mentions those cities I just read off to you about the Southern, uh, about the Northern Park. So that's part of the problem. Uh, but does it ultimately matter? No, candidly, no. It doesn't when it comes down to it. Yes, sir. I never see it done, but it, I think it would be helpful mm -hmm. if we had like on the screen a map. Well, I, sure. No. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I would. I didn't have time to throw one together. Sure. I've never seen it any any place that mm -hmm. it's really important if you can see. Sure. You can visualize Paul in different people. Yes. Here, here, and here. Yeah. Absolutely. So scholars who identify the recipients of the letters as believers in the southern cities of Galatia date, which is what I believe, are those who are are ascribed to the southern. Okay. So that's kind of the where we're at. Um, AD 49, AD 50. Uh, why would that date be important? Just going to throw that out there, see if anybody has any thoughts. Why would that date be important? 49 and 50 AD. How, how far removed are we from the resurrection? 20 years, maybe. Give or take 15 years, something like that, uh, from the resurrection. So we're talking about the early years of the church. This is also churches that uh, Paul Paul had a methodology when it came to going to different places. What's the first place? What's what was his kind of methodology? And I'll throw this out there. The starting point was he stayed on major Roman roads, so he utilized the transportation system of the area as he traveled. But he 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 was obviously within the Roman Empire, but he'd stay on major Roman roads and he would hit major cities 
that had what? Synagogue. They had the synagogue. So he would go to find the Jews first, the ones that were waiting for news of the Messiah. He would go into the synagogue and he would reason with them that Jesus was the one. And then from there, he would go outside in essence and go, also all of you need to know this. But he used the synagogue because that was a great foundational starting point for these churches. These were the people who had been waiting for the Messiah. And now he had come and they were outside of Jerusalem and may not have known that all of that had transpired in Jerusalem. And so there was this in essence of going, let me tell you what happened. The Messiah came. It wasn't like what we were expecting. We were expecting him to come back and get rid of Rome. Not the case. In fact, it's a spiritual kingdom, and it's the church, and it's now, and it's here, and the times of ignorance are no longer here. But he stayed on this path, constantly on major Roman roads, mm -hmm. to cities with synagogues. In fact, did he pass by cities? We see this. In fact, he says, we know, and as he went by through Ampopolis and Apollonia, and he kept going until he found a, a, a town with a synagogue. And then he would go in and reason with them, as was his custom, and then he would continue on to the next city in that way. That's how he was establishing these churches. He was moving along in those ways. Did, did he get generally get good acceptance? Generally, yes. I mean, you always have those who don't. You have those that do. Uh, if you look at as he made his way down into Greece, once he crossed over, um, you see some interesting moments where the Thessalonians rushed him out of town as fast as possible. But then the Bereans said they were of more noble character and sought in the scriptures to see if what he was teaching every day to see if what he's teaching was true. And then you get down to Athens and you see some, because we know there's a church in Athens later, and then Corinth, there was a lot of acceptance there and he stayed there for quite a while. So there was a lot of hit and miss, but like you would find in most places. The problem was that Thessalonians actually did what? They followed him and pursued him and kept on coming after him. They, they weren't going to let him continue to spew his, um, you know, his heresies in essence as much as possible. So you had both good reception and bad reception, good soil, bad soil all along the way in that area. Um, the church uh, in Galatia were comprised of both Jewish and Gentile converts. Um, so we see this quite clearly throughout scripture. Paul's purpose in writing these churches was to confirm them in the faith, especially concerning justification by faith alone, apart from the works of the law of Moses. And this is where we have to dive in a little bit to the controversy is what was happening. Judaizers. Anybody give me a rundown of Judaizers? Who those lovely folks were? <laughs> Basically, uh, what's a good way of putting that, Greg? Well, they thought that you had to become a Jew before you could oh. become a Christian. Correct. In fact, so salvation was from the Jews was very much a, a major premise missing the spiritual connection that Jesus was making, and instead focusing on the physical connection that they often had. In fact, they would come into town and they would say, well, how in the world could you know about the Messiah if you aren't actually looking for the Messiah? And the Messiah is meant to come from the Jews and the lineage of the Jews and the lineage of all the history and the people and the rest. So you need to become a Jew to truly inherit or become part of the lineage that is this new Messiah. So this wasn't Judaizers and people who were Jewish fully in the sense that uh, they were nationalistic. It was a little bit more about, no, no, you need to become like this. You need to keep our customs, our traditions, and the rest. That's what you need to keep hold of, including, and one of the major ones especially was circumcision. So circumcision, keeping the feasts, keeping all of the different things, the temple, and the rest. Now, is there a problem with that based off of actually Jesus' well, teachings? Not, but, uh, it's like a, a major hurdle. Uh, it's 100%. In fact, most of Galatians is Paul going, stop hurting others by adding to the word of God, by adding to these things. We are no longer in the law. We are redeemed through the blood of Christ. And so there is this back and forth of culture and tradition versus the word, the word and will of God. And don't miss this because I do believe, and I really want to make sure, this, I do believe Judaizers most often are often well-intentioned people because there is beauty and, and, and purpose in a lot of things in traditions. 
Now, this is coming from a guy who has balked against traditions for most of my lifetime. In fact, um, one of the running jokes for a long time is when somebody would say, um, Brandon's a preacher. How does that work out? And he, like, he doesn't even own a suit and tie. And that's like <laughs> was one of these running jokes for a while. And I used to joke, well, preachers don't have to have a suit and tie. In fact, there was articles that used to be put out by a great group called the Babylon Bee, which is like a, a satire group. And they put out one that it was like archaeologists find Jesus's three-piece suit, uh, you know, buried in the sand. And so it's, you think about it as kind of a joke, but it's a cultural thing. It is absolutely. In fact, when you stop thinking about it, uh, suits and ties were not really something until about 150 to 200 years ago, this cultural association, but it's been associated within. However, there's nothing wrong with it. However, are there people who well in their well-intentioned ways have made it a sign of you being a good Christian and adhere sin to not doing those things? Um, in fact, as part of this, I just kind of want to throw out what other things are cultural, uh, cultural additions that we might have that we might not actually think about very often, but if we were to bind it it would be exactly what Paul is speaking about in, in Galatians. I'll give you one other one. Um, pews. Is seating ever mentioned in like the Bible? So my dear friends uh, growing up in Italy, Catholics, they have the prayer benches. And so that's what most of them use. So one of my dear friends, when he came over from Italy to visit one of the churches in the United States, walked in and saw pews and goes, you guys have been influenced by the Catholics. You have pews and i went wait wait is that a thing i go and he was like this tells me you're not a faithful congregation i went because we have pews <laughs> what do they have then chairs because when they come out of catholicism they just use chairs individual chairs like we have <laughs> here today and they don't think but but because they associate it with a specific group that they've come out of they look at somebody else culturally and go look at you i mean you've been influenced by the pews you've been influenced by the catholics well, now it sounds ridiculous right when you stop and think about it, it sounds ridiculous however um a few years back and this is a true story that happened to a friend of mine um he uh, they went over to a tribe in africa where they actually um worshiped with them and they managed to convert almost the whole entire tribe and the um the tribe the new preacher that they were training in the rest wanted a suit and tie so that he could preach because that's what the preacher when he went over there wore so that became the thing now most of the women in the tribe were topless this was a very primitive tribe in that thing so the church did a whole drive to get clothing to send over to them the women were so grateful so thankful and then the next sunday they showed up and all of the tops had been cut holes out of them <laughs> because that's how they provided for their children. And so our cultural concept of modesty or the rest <laughs> met this cultural of going, oh, wow, thank you for this great gift. And then we went, you missed the point. And then they go, what's the point? I, I thought we were, I mean, it's, this is where we are. Now, I'm not making an argument that all cultures and all things are fine, okay? Don't hear me say that. What I am saying is, do you note how often it's easy for us to associate something as being Christian that may not be Christian simply because that's the way that we actually grow? Yes. Um, this struck me the first time I went to Jamaica, and um, and I had just never, I, I just, I can't remember what my concept before was, but I, I remember thinking oh it's gonna be really cool to hear the jamaicans worship it's gonna you know it's gonna be a new experience and all this kind of stuff and and it was um 1930s 40s and 50s american hymns mm -hmm. and it was like for a vis for, for a visitor in jamaica or for the jamaicans in the village mm -hmm. it would have been well to become a christian i guess i have to learn about american old american music first yeah and and so now I think missionary groups have, yeah. churches have gotten better about realizing, you know, it's probably better to have a native <clears throat> be preacher instead of some, you know, but, but, you know, they were 
to become a Christian, you had to become an American. Yes. Well, I mean, that, and not literally. I mean, that, 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 good that, intentions. That, 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 that's not just us. Uh, yeah. Oh, no, yeah. It used to be, oh, that, yeah. It, it used to be though, that when the Lutherans mm -hmm. would go into a foreign country, mm -hmm. the first thing they did was establish a school to teach the native German. Correct. Uh, because yes. Because you couldn't worship. Unless you're worshiping Unless in Germany. Were, uh, well, and even you tie that into the Catholics in Latin. But, so, I mean, that was, you can't read the Bible if it's not in Latin, as if that was the original language it was written in. Exactly. So there's, and the whole point of all of this is so much for us to catch that so much of Galatians may seem distant. Like nobody here, and this is not to be crass, this is biblical, nobody here is forcing anybody to become circumcised. So the actual thing that they're having to deal with, the law of Moses and the rest, may not feel like it's relevant to us today, but I'm telling you it is. The, the Galatians is unbelievably relevant as it pertains to both progressivism and what we would call, call even ultra-conservatism within churches of Christ and churches across the globe. Because we have this bad habit of both adding or taking away fairly constantly as to how we define Christianity and how we define what it means and what one must do to become a Christian. So I've said for years to my Catholic friends, I'm amazed at how, uh, how I joked with them about how they watered down baptism, quite literally. Like it's, it's literally like just taking away water constantly. When the actual translation of the word, and you might know this, baptizos, the Greek word is means immersion. That's what it means. And so you have to retranslate it or change it culturally to fit any modern perspective of what that word means. What's been fun to see is with a mass community church movement in the United States, breaking away from, ironically, um, breaking away from a lot of the denominationalism. Uh, some of us may look at that and go, oh man, there's just 30,000 more churches now. But in some ways, I want to rejoice in that because they're breaking away from man-made additions and traditions, which makes them more likely to look at a church and go, okay, so it's not just about the name on the door anymore. Maybe what they're teaching inside matters. Maybe what they believe matters. And that's a good thing. That is a healthy thing when we have more and more people going, does the Bible actually teach this? Is this really Christian? Or is it a cultural addition to so if you look at uh, Galatians, and I'll just read from my notes real quick, Galatians was written because the churches of that region were facing a theological crisis. The essential truth of justification by faith rather than by human works was being denied by the Judaizers, legalistic Jews who insisted that Christians must keep the Mosaic law. In particular, the Judaizers insisted on circumcision as a requirement for Gentiles who wish to be saved. In other words, convert to Judaism first, and then you are eligible to become a Christian. When Paul learned that this heresy was being taught in the Galatian churches, he composed an epistle to emphasize our liberty in Christ and to counter the perversion of the Gospels that the Judaizers were promoting in that area. Um, and some key verses. If you want to write down some key verses, Galatians 2.16 says this. Know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law, because by observing the law, no one will be justified. Paul does not mince words when it comes to you're not earning your salvation by becoming a Jew. You're not going to earn your salvation by anything outside of Jesus Christ. Stop doing that. Don't let these heresies continue forward. So uh, let me just see if we can find a practical approach to this. What would be an addition, outside of some of the ones we've said, an addition that we see broadly in Christendom? So I'm talking about outside of Christian Church of Christ here, okay? Broadly in Christian, what's some additions that you see that people have started making nowadays? What are some extra things one might, might have to do? Easter. Okay. So yeah, celebrate certain things automatically, like you have to do that, as opposed to the fact that you may do that because you have freedom in Christ. But if you start to make it like a specific, you have to do this. Anything specific when you, in that illustration that you guys, mm -hmm. I mean, is there any? Sure. Uh, so one of the things I've seen recently over and over again um, is, and I'll, I'll, I'll yeah, because I'm not afraid to dive into weird contexts and even some culturally insensitive things, but um, 
So right now, if our if your church does not have an active course or class or something in racial reconciliation, are you really a Christian? That's a big push in our culture right now. And the reality is, is that the implication is if you're not, then you must be racist. racist. And that's a highly problematic implication, especially for our culture today. Now, I'm just going to say that's a heresy. In fact, it's one of those that I've preached against quite consistently. In fact, what I would call uh, one of the major heresies, Gnostic heresies, which is the addition of the secret knowledge that you kind of have to know and the rest that we have in our modern Christian culture today is the concept of reconciliation by ethnic Gnosticism. So ethnic, uh, like <clears throat> we inherit sin solely by the pigmentation of our skin. Well, that is a heresy and a Gnostic one at that. Who would believe that anyway if you had a brain? Well, <laughs> it's, sadly, um, sadly, it's a what I would call weaponized guilt. Again, it's weaponized. weaponized guilt. It's made to make you feel bad in our current culture that if you don't agree with these things, that you're somehow doing something wrong. And that is weaponized guilt. That is Gnosticism. That is an addition to God's word. In fact, when somebody would ask me, um, I've read a lot, and some of you who came to our uh, contemporary concerns know that I spent three years studying on critical race theory, critical uh, critical theory, and the rest. And I wrote my thesis, my entire uh, final thesis was on, in essence, Gnosticism, the Gnostic teachings that are found within racial reconciliation within Christendom, within Christianity broadly, and the fact that it is inherently evil. It is a heresy that actually pits people against one another, and it says, you have power over me solely by the pigmentation of your skin. And that is inherently sinful to make such a claim. And then to weaponize that to where I'm somehow wrong <laughs> simply because I disagree with you on the importance of that discussion is even worse. And so that's a highly problematic thing for us to deal with. Um, let me give you a second verse, Genesis 2 or Galatians 2.20, another big one for uh, Galatians. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Yes, ma'am. Uh -huh. Galatians 2.20, 2.20, yes. 220. And then I'll also give you Galatians 3.11. Clearly, no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. Over and over again, these additions to Scripture, these additions to the Word of God. If you have uh, my dear friends who would uh, send me, going back to the concept of ethnic Gnosticism, um, they would say, Brandon, you disagree with us, but have you read this book? <clears throat> I'm like, yes, I have, actually. Well, have you read this book? Yes, I have. Now, here's what they've actually said. Yes, I know the Bible's there, but have you also read this? This gives you a better understanding of the Bible. They're this gives you a better direction. You Correct. Well, I've already been there. That's the problem. I've already been there, and I still disagree with them. That's the problem. It's so over and over again, but the implication is you need Jesus plus something else. In fact, Galatians, that's the way I like to term it a lot, is the book that says, don't give me Jesus plus anything else. Jesus is all I need. Don't add to what I need to do to become a Christian, to stay in the, in the church, to stay saved in this life. So I don't need Jesus plus Ibram Kendi and Jesus plus Robin DiAngelo and all these authors and the rest. I don't need that. What I need is Jesus. There is nothing I can't learn from Scripture about loving my brother, no matter their background, that I can't learn from the Bible. Now, I am also one of those who's encouraging you to come to a book club tonight and to talk about books and the rest. So I'm not anti-literature, that you can't learn things from other things. But there is nothing about my salvation that I cannot learn through Scripture. I'm not going to learn how to be a better Christian inherently because of a human's thoughts on the inspired Word of God. The inspired Word of God does that best, period. So that's kind of what I'm, I wanted to make very clear in kind of these conversations. Um, Galatians 4, 5 and 6. <clears throat> to redeem those under the law that we might receive the full rights of sons. 
because you are sons. God sent mm -hmm. the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba Father, the connection to the spirit of God. Galatians 5, 22 and through 23, you know this one fairly well, I would hope, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. In fact, what he's actually arguing is all this extra stuff and all these extra things that anybody wants you to do with circumcision, and you have to do this, and you have to do that, and you have to read this book. In fact, he goes, no, 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 stop that. Let me tell you what there is no law against love and joy and peace and patience there's no law against being a godly christian there's no law against that so stop this nonsense focus on the things that actually matter and just a little note last night uh, me and some of the college students had an opportunity to go see uh c.s lewis live on stage at the mershon uh c.s lewis the the most reluctant convert to the play it was fantastic it's really good i, I wish it was for more than one night it was just one night and uh <clears throat> here in Columbus, but it's a traveling show that goes different places. And if you've never read C.S. Lewis's, um, it's kind of his memoir, it's called Surprised by Joy. And after the First World War, joy was something he always said would, he thought would escape him forever. And that when he realized that joy was something that was still within his grasp, and that that was actually found from his atheism into his faith in God, that that faith transported him into knowing the difference between happiness and understanding. And in fact, the words, the terminology he uses was, I want to drink at the fountain of joy and that joy alone is Jesus. It's just a fantastic connection. So when I see love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, against such thing, there is no law. So that is what, if you want to answer anyone in our world today, you keep trying to add, let me tell you what I'm focusing on. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. And these things will answer all of your claims and all of the things that are out there because there is no law against these. And uh, lastly, just one of the last verses is God 6 and 7. This is a fantastic one. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. And so this is why when we have churches that are out in our world right now that are going off in all sorts of different directions and the rest, and we had this conversation the other day as a staff, um, there's a reason why there's a lot of excitement around here right now at this church. There's a reason why we have visitors and people coming with us and the rest. And it's not because we have the greatest, fanciest programs or everything perfect or everybody here is great and nobody is weird or odd. In fact, we're quite the opposite. But what the focus is, is that we focus on the word of God. That's the key. That's the component. That, that is the focus of what we do. The rest we let fall where it may. Uh, Sunday morning was fantastic. When between the two services, we had over 350 people. And we looked up and we went, okay, wow, didn't realize that. I mean, it was just one of those moments where you go, well, in spite of us, God is doing great things. That if we just focus on the things, God will not, we cannot deceive God with great programs. We could bring thousands of people in by preaching a different message than what we preach. But that doesn't matter. What matters is, are we going to be focusing on God? And God will bring the increase. And God is bringing the increase because success is based off of faithfulness. That's the difference. Faithfulness is not numbers, is not all these other things. Faithfulness is not um, can you grow your church to become more like the Judaizers or more like an individual person and what they think everything should be like? In fact, that's one of the downsides of a large church is people will start to actually have to realize it's not actually about them. And so we have a lot of people in our churches who love to have opinions, don't we? I'm one of them, so I'm not looking at it as a negative. I love to have opinions. But guess what? Some of y'all may do stuff differently than me. You're qualified, though. Well, something like that. I don't know if I'm qualified. <laughs> but based off of that, I, I need you to catch the fact that we, we learn to stop thinking as a small church. And we start realizing... We're, we're, no, we're we're a big church. And I don't mean just numbers. I mean because it's not about me as an individual. It's about us as a people of God, and us as a people of God can do far more in our community than we can just individually. That's the beauty of the church. It's the beauty of coming together. And Galatians says, "Don't get lost in the weeds. Don't get lost on the things don't don't matter." Um, I don't know who said it, but it goes back a while. Don't minor and major things and major and minor things. 
That's the you know the fact is is being Jewish in and of itself was not inherently evil. Celebrating the feast, not inherently evil. Uh, being circumcised, not inherently evil. But when you make it a bound of salvation, of you have to do this, that's where suddenly you're no longer focused on God. You're focused on what you want God to do. And that's where control comes into play. And you're trying to control the scenario instead of letting God do what God does best, which is a work through his people in spite of us, in spite of our failings and faults, to change the world around us. And that's what we're seeing right now. That's what we're seeing right now where we are. Um, people are coming to know God in different ways than just Sunday mornings. They're coming on Tuesdays. They're coming on, I said, I love people who come to a Bible class on Tuesday mornings. That's fantastic. And it's not just because you're retirees. It's because you care. It's because you want to continue to grow in your faith. And that's a fantastic thing. So as a brief summary, uh, let me give you this, and then we'll go into just a couple of few things. The fact that we are justified by grace through faith means we have spiritual freedom. We are not under bondage to the dictates of the Old Testament law. We're not under the bondage of those things. Paul soundly condemns anyone who would denigrate the grace of God and attempt to change the gospel. You can see that in Galatians 1, 8 through 10. He gives his kind of apostolic credentials, basically saying like, here's who I am, right? So this is what I do, and emphasizes that righteousness comes through Christ, not the works of the law. It comes through Christ, not the works of the law. You're not going to earn your salvation, so stop trying. Instead, as I like to look at the book of James, James is, sometimes I look at it as kind of a companion in some ways, where Galatians is, don't you add, James also kind of backs and forth and says, but here's the basic everyday life. Here's the, the little things that you can do, and James hints at the fact that says we don't work to be saved we work because we are saved so we're not trying to earn our salvation we work because it's the joy to be a christian sometimes we get that background oh all the time it, it's just yes absolutely so salvation is the work of god and we must be born again through water and through spirit we see that through uh, not only galatians but we see that through romans and acts a lot of places through baptism um over and over again we that's highlighted by paul external religious rites such as circumcision are of no value in the realm of the spirit that's they're just it's it's a side note so in our modern context i told you like I said you know circumcision is not a huge thing for us to discuss as a culture but in our modern thing, we have to start keeping an eye on what are some of the additions or subtractions. Now, Greg and I have talked a few times about that some of the most legalistic people in the world are actually what we would confer as progressives, people who are more progressive in their faith. And so, Greg, if you want to give like a quick one minute kind of breakdown of that, that conversation we've had there. Well, I mean, in, you begin looking and... Um, you know, the idea that in order to be the church you ought to be, you have to bring in uh, elements of entertainment, mm -hmm. uh, that you have to have, and I love good lighting, but that you have to dim the lights and mm -hmm. have theater lighting in order to uh, reach out, or that you should be miking uh, mm -hmm. certain singers and doing these kinds of things and if you don't do any of that yes that you're not the church you ought to be correct and so that's the kind of the, the argument in essence is if you don't do those things are you really trying to reach this generation and that in and of itself is a binding thing where they're now implying sin or error because you're not doing it the way that they do it it becomes a legalistic point where they go see you don't really care about people See, you don't really care. And so suddenly Christianity, the goalposts have moved. Clay? I was just going to say, though, the whole, it, with the, and it's not just in religion, mm -hmm. but other areas of life where people <laughs> become more progressive or more liberal or however you want to term it. But it's, you have to be exactly where I am. That's yes. how legalistic it is. If you're even slightly more progressive than you're bad, yeah, but if you're not doing exactly what they want, if you don't reach that point, yeah, but it's exactly that point oftentimes. Yes, with with people in that mindset, if you're not exactly like me, you are wrong. Yeah, you're, you're or 
canceled. Yes. Our, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I don't want to hit on this. I'm not just going after progressivism because earlier on, I was literally making light of the fact that we've had a historical tradition at times, even within our own churches, of binding on things that are not bound by scripture. We bound on clothing at times, and I'm not talking about modesty. I'm talking about binding on what a good Christian should wear. You know, we bind on those things when scripture does not. We bind on a lot of things at times that are just kind of ludicrous. What version, you're what version of the Bible you're using, right? So there's things along the way. Now, there's some of them that we could look, make theological arguments against, right? But that's not actually the arguments that were being made. It was mostly like, you don't have my translation, thus you're somehow wrong. That's the problem. It's a mindset that's the problem. It's the mindset that tries to earn salvation by good works. Um, and in fact, it's the one that stands before God and goes, aren't you glad we're not like those people? Now, that's not how we say it, but what we do is we go, we attend the right church. And the implication is we've got something right that they don't. And the standard is not God's word. It's purely either cultural or our thought process on it. And that's where we, that's why I want to just constantly push us back to scripture over and over again. What does God desire for worship? What does God desire for himself? Because worship is for him, not for us. We become beneficiaries of those things. Does singing bring out joy in all of us? I hope it does. Does praying before God bring you before the throne of God? It absolutely should. Does hearing the word of God ex exposed and thought of and contemplated and played before you, is that meant to edify you in a lot of ways? Yes, but it's to the glorification of God. And if we miss that, then it becomes about us. Then suddenly a mindset changes. And now it becomes what I like, what I want. And how many churches have been torn apart by that, those mentalities over and over again historically? That's why Galatians is such not just a powerful book, but it's important for us today to realize that the Galatians constantly points and goes, it's not about you. It's about God. This is not about all your whims and desires and the things you wish God had said. But instead, it's about what God has actually said. Stop adding to his word. Stop also taking away from his word. Because while Judaizers were saying you had to be Jewish to be this, uh, to become a Christian, don't miss that people do that today and saying, yes, but you also need to read this, do this, be this, attend a church that has this. <clears throat> Can you really be a church if you don't have, uh, you know, if you don't have a good praise team? Can you really be a good church? I mean, you guys don't have instruments. Do you really care about people? Don't you know that's what people really like? And so over and over again, I'm like, I have more of a spiritual experience with the guitar. And I always go, that's a weird statement to make. Mm. But also the other side of it, I go, but that seems to be a lot about you. And so over and over again, when your mindset is it's about me, don't be surprised when people end up adding to or taking away of scripture. Now, I also want to make sure we're very careful because it's not that we're a perfect people in this. We still have moments, even within our own church family, where these issues arise every once in a while. And it's rarely doctrinal, but a lot of times it's matters of convenience or things. And I'll, I'll, I'll lean into it because I can, because I've only been here six months, so it's fine. Um, I know that there are people who would rather us pass the trays again. Yeah. Ah, see, yeah. I knew it. Everybody's like, yes, but I know. Um, and yeah. there's an aspect where there's nothing. I don't, I personally, because I, I'm not a, a person who's bought into like, so we, you know, we did all the, all the you know, the, staying out of public and all those things for the last couple of years and all that with my kids and my family and health and rest kind of doesn't bother me one way or the other the other side of it is it just doesn't matter in the end it'd be nice yeah, sure it would and honestly if we did it it wouldn't bother anybody i don't think it would bother me at all but in the end it's i mean they didn't have trains then in the first century they didn't you weren't here in the 70s. No, I wasn't. Oh, no, I'm sorry. When I started here... Well, he was talking first century. Yeah, I was talking first century, yes. But I wasn't here in the 70s either. I remember he would have walked in that door on Sunday morning mm -hmm. when I started coming with Paul Tews. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't wear jeans. You wouldn't look like this. No. You wouldn't have jeans. You sure. Press a pants, yes. a tie. Yes. A white shirt. It was yeah. Better then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those seventies were some great years, y'all had. 
<laughs> well, I see, and all of those things in and of themselves, there's, they're not inherently wrong to say those things, even even jokingly or even truthfully. There's nothing inherently wrong to say it. The problem is when you ascribe it to somebody else's spirituality. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, yes, sir. <laughs> What's that? When I started working mm -hmm. back in 72, you know, I, I wore a coat and tie, sometimes a suit at work. And then in the late 80s, I was told not to wear a tie and that's a yep. symbol of authority. Yep. So, you know, these things, you know, I, I, I get what they're yeah. relevant. Yeah. They can be, they can, I guess, in, I don't know. The, the thing I think about is you know, we have a good, I think, diverse group. Mm -hmm. Yes. But what about the poor? I don't sure. Know we have a lot of poor. Yeah. And if we're all too dressed up, do they feel uncomfortable? Yeah. yeah I, I, In Upper Arlington of all places, right? <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll give this is kind of funny that you, that you mentioned that. Um, so a few years back, um, when I was in uh, Dallas, I had somebody come to me and they said, you know, um, and this is a true story. Um, they said, you know, I'm, I'm really kind of offended by how long your hair gets at times. And I said, well, that's fascinating. Um, and I, I didn't really know how to respond to it in the moment. I was like, okay, sweet. I don't know what you want me to do with that. And they kind of stood there because I think they were th trying to get a rise out of me in some way. And I was just like, okay. Oh, this isn't for you. Like, my wife likes longer hair. So she is going to win that battle between you and her. That's where she's at. Um and then I somebody for a second, like, yeah i thought you were talking about his wife no no it's like yeah no and so <laughs> so then you're becoming, you're yes becoming too attractive so then life. not even no yeah not even 10 minutes later had somebody came up who thanked me for the fact that she was like i like the fact that you don't always wear suits and ties and stuff all the time it actually makes me feel more like at peace and i went okay what is happening today <laughs> And so I was like, well, no matter what, I seem to be offending or somebody's going to be happy one way or the other. So then I remember at Christmas time, I got a haircut naturally. And then I wore, uh, because it was just that time of the year or whatever. And then I wore slacks on a Sunday with a polo shirt. And the guy that had come up to me the first time came up and said, I really appreciate you hearing me out. Then the girl who said it to me the other way came up to me. She goes, I don't get it. Like, why do you, why did you bend to their wills? And I went, boy, no matter what I do, somebody's going to get offended in some way or another, one way or the other. And what was funny is I told the girl, I said, it's funny, you know, you, you said it's not about clothing, but now you've become the very thing that you said you were not about. And then I went to him and I said, it's funny because you, you said it's not about this, but you've become now the very thing that you said it wasn't about. Both we're worried more about what they believed than what was actually at the heart of things. And I, and candidly, I, I, when I spent some actually time thinking about it, I went, am I not living a life in a way that they know who I am outside of what I look like? And it was kind of a reevaluation. I kind of had to sit back and go, so what does that mean? Because I'm not going to, I'm not going to appease everybody. It's impossible. Uh, when I'm on campus and the rest and I'll wear jeans and t-shirt and the rest, I fit in with everybody. But if I come to church, am I really meant to change? And I don't mean change in the sense of who I am as an individual, but who I represent on a daily basis, I would argue at times is more important than the one or two hours that I'm here every week. In fact, in a culture that is so set on identity, everything's about identity. The one thing that I can most be is simply be the person that I am. And that person needs to reflect Christ. But in our culture, that means that people will be offended. They just simply will, because we live in a culture of people who love to be offended. So instead, so instead, how can I balance those things? How can I engage in conversations? And so that's what I learned after that one moment when the guy came up to me. Now my response, typically, if somebody were to come and say that, and it doesn't happen nearly as often as it used to, um, and I would say the, this, the Midwest is different. I haven't had really anybody say anything here. It's just different. South, whole other ball game. Mm -hmm. But up here, I've, it's been a bit different. And if somebody were to come to me now, I'd be like, man, that's that's fascinating. Could you tell me why you hold to such a, a belief? Like, 
What's your background? Where'd you grow up and the rest? And I try to engage them in questions and concepts and a discussion on it. Because what people typically find out is they don't actually believe what they're saying. They're simply saying it because it's what they've always seen. And if I can get them to engage in that conversation, then hopefully I can get them back to the simplicity of scripture, the simplicity of what God has set forth for us. Yes, a respect for God matters, but a respect for God in their life is far more important than what I believe they look like in their respect. Does that make sense? Like, because there's a lot of people that I know who, um, oh yeah, no, this is a great one. I can close this out with. Um, a couple of years back, uh, I was a youth minister in Buford, Georgia, and um, a young lady came in, drop dead gorgeous young lady, very short skirt, low cut top. She was there, never seen her before. And I was, I saw her from a distance across the auditorium. It's a big congregation, about 650 members. And she was sitting over there kind of with the youth section. And then I saw a mom beeline towards me. She, and I was like, oh, here we go. Here we go. And she beelines up and she goes, did you see what she's wearing? And I went, I'm trying not to. <laughs> and so, and so and she instantly was like, what? And I was, did you, I was like, I don't need, I said, do you know her name? She was no. And I said, neither do I. I've never seen her before. I said, could I encourage you just to go ask her her name? I'm like, see where she's from and the rest. Mm -hmm. About 20 minutes later, she comes back walking over and very different demeanor. She said, her name's Madison. She's 16. Her mom died last week. And she decided she was going to come to church to find God because she hopes her mom's okay. And she knew that she had to wear her best clothing on Sunday. And that's her most expensive dress. So that's why she's here. And I went, could I, could I get you to take her to lunch? She goes, we're already going to lunch. Stop talking. And I went, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. People dress up more for funerals than they do for coming. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then in the scripture, it says something about someone coming in dressed well. You're telling them to sit here. Correct. And he yeah. say, His dress very well over here. Uh, so that pesky family, book of James. <laughs> yes. They must have come. Some come again dressed. Yes. I mean, dressed yes. up however it was. Well, some were had money and some, some did not. Yeah. That. that pesky book of James yeah. keeps getting in the way yeah. of. I mean, our thought processes on richness and poorness and the rest. And what was fascinating is uh, that young lady was baptized about three months later, um, has a fantastic relationship with that family to this day, um, all because of our perceptions can change. I love the fact that she said she wore her best, most expensive dress because that's what she thought she was supposed to wear. But she had no understanding of Christianity or modesty and the rest. She, But that was her perception of church. And I remember going, oh, what a tragic perception of church. That's a tragic perception that she thinks clothing is ultimately what's going to get her in good standing. That's just a, no, Jesus, Jesus is what's going to get you in within good standing with the church and with God. That's what's going to make things whole. Not that you can fake your way on the outside to something else. And I'm grateful for people who have been able to walk with individuals through those times. Now, she's a completely different young lady. She has a family and children now and the rest. And it's a completely different scenario. But in that moment, we get so lost in these little cultural things along the way. Somewhere yes, ma'am. It says, come as you are. It does. It does say that. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I do, mm -hmm. I do believe and support mm -hmm. the idea of being tolerant with, with new yeah. believers and, yeah. and visitors. Mm -hmm. However, on a personal note, I have recently had to walk away from a few different environments mm -hmm. because the Lord revealed to me that people were not taking heed to mm -hmm. the, they were not taking heed mm -hmm. to their behavior and to God's word when they came to the sanctuary. Oh, sure. Oh, they absolutely. They were not taking heed. And, I, mm -hmm. and it was becoming a polluting, defiling sure. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. They were not God. No, absolutely. And the, the fact is, is that um, uh, there's no better place for hypocrites than church. Because I hope you all understand we're all of that in That's some way, right? Belong. It's where we belong. It's like, there's no better place for sick people than a hospital. <laughs> it's that's where you're supposed to be. 
the same time, um, and it's one of the statements I've used, and it's not original to me, which is it's okay to not be okay, but it's not okay to stay that way. And that's the difference, is that it's okay to come here and say, I've got these problems. It's not okay to continue to living in sin. Paul specifically notes that he says, shall we continue sinning so that grace may abound? Absolutely not. Well, we change our actions to match the faith that we profess. And that's a balancing act. So I've kept us too long already. Um, yes, sir. One more thing on dressing. You've yeah. probably heard, maybe back alone, don't hear much anymore, mm -hmm. suppose, but come dress in your Sunday best. Sunday best, yes. <laughs> Do you all know where that came from? The 50s. So it's, it, and, and you also understand, uh, this is one of my favorite cultural discussions, um, the um, Sunday night services, what? where that came about. Sunday night services. Okay. Farmers. Where? Farmers. When wow. farmers had to work the crops during the summers and the rest, they needed to have a later service in the day for farmers. And in fact, I remember it was a couple of years back, there was like a huge thing. It was like, well, church is doing away with Sunday night services. We're no longer scriptural people. And we go, <laughs> well, we weren't scriptural people for about 1900 years then until about the 1920s or 30s, if that's the mentality. Instead, it's, you know, I'm going to be there every time the elders have the door open. And I always want to go, ooh, okay, so the elders have the ability to close the doors? No, no, that's God. But understand the context, right? So the idea that if the elders set a specific time, it's an automatic, like, have to, can't, don't, will, won't, instead of it being, I'm there because I want to worship God to the best of my abilities. But we've made an attachment to it that's cultural. Um, the old... Um, don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Y'all remember that statement? That mm -hmm. would do. You remember where that came from? Because the uh, father would take the bath first on a Saturday night, and then the mother, and then the oldest child, and they would go down to the baby. And by the time the baby was there, the bathwater was a little dirty. And so I used to, it says, "Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater." The premise would also be, um, and this is one thing I've joked about for years: is we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. But we do need to change the bathwater because the bathwater is dirty. And if you can no longer see why we do things, the reason we do things, we may be missing who we actually say we are. Why do we worship on the first day of the week? Because the Lord said so. Why do we worship on Sunday evening? Because it's a culturally expedient time that allows us to do such, and it's a great thing for our congregation. And the elders said And Absolutely. But will it always be that way? No, it may not. It may change. You never know. Same thing with Wednesday nights. What if we moved it, Lord forbid, to Thursdays? I'll be here. Because guess what? That's what we did in Italy growing up. Really? We met Thursday nights. And so you might look at that and go, that's crazy talk, Thursday nights, <laughs> right? But the whole point is, is why do we do the things that we do? Is it scriptural? Is it a matter of convenience that we do those things? But ultimately is, are we going to be the people who are mindful of following the word of God or then getting upset about cultural things we don't like that they change when in reality they don't ultimately matter? Right. Yes, sir. When I mm -hmm. grew up in Nashville, mm -hmm. midweek service at some congregations in Nashville was Thursday, Thursday nights. Yeah. And so they would, whenever they would talk about the midweek service, they would say Wednesday or Thursday evening. Now it coalesced to Wednesday, yeah. but it changed over time. Even back in the 1970s, yeah, there were congregations that, that era long ago. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Do you have something? I was just going yes. to say that we'd have to meet on Wednesdays and Thursdays. <laughs> yes, I think we should. Yes. Oh, I know. Or you know, maybe Tuesday mornings. You know, things like that. <laughs> I think everybody should be here Tuesday. Morning. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank y'all so much for coming today. Greg, would you lead us in a closing prayer? Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the time we've had together and thankful for the presentation Brandon has given to us. We ask that our hearts would be open to your truth and that we would apply it to our lives. Strengthen us in your service, for it's through Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Friend.